We are live. Great, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the uh, Finance and Audit Committee meeting uh, for the California High Speed Rail Authority's Board of Directors uh, for February 16th, 2023, and Happy New Year to you all. Um, today's agenda, we'll start with uh, is the calling of the roll, if you will, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair Richards. Here. Vice Chair Miller. Here. Director Gometti. Present. All right, thank you. We do have a, a quorum. Um, with that, we'll uh, move uh, first into uh, public comments. Uh, do we have anybody who's registered for public, public comments, uh, Kurt? No public comments? Okay, hearing and seeing none. I don't have any in-person uh, right. public comments. All right, we'll move on to today's agenda. Uh, item number one is the um, committee uh, mi uh, minutes for the November 17th meeting. Uh, do we have a motion for approval? Moved. Okay. Second. A, thank you. A motion by uh, Nancy Miller and a second by uh, Director Gilmetti. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Okay, thank you. Passed unanimously. Item number two this uh, today uh, in the chair's uh, comments, we're going to have an update on our Div diversity, equity, and inclusion task force uh, from our director of communications, Melissa Figueroa. Good morning, Melissa. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Melissa Figaro. I'm the head of uh, strategic communications for the authority, and I have the great privilege of overseeing the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts for the authority. I am here today to provide you with an update. Uh, a few months ago, you heard from Paula Rivera on an audit conducted uh, within our authority on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And I am proud to report we have a number of positive updates to, to give to you this morning. So the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, mission, let me make sure I can get our, there we go, is to ensure the authority is a safe, diverse, equitable, and inclusive and representative department internally and provides opportunity for all contractors and businesses in California, consistent with or exceeding state, federal, and federal policy objectives and goals. Since our last discussion, we have established a DEI task force. We have 11 voting members from key sections of the program. That includes procurement, program delivery, legal, small business, human resources, and our regional offices as well. We meet six times a year. We've already met once this year. And our additional DEI advisory group is a larger organization comprised of uh, individuals from around the authority who have volunteered their time to provide their input and thoughts on ways that we can improve as an organization. That advisory group meets quarterly and we will we'll work to provide feedback and guidance to the executive staff and the CEO on ways that we can improve our diversity, equity and inclusion efforts. Given that we are still working on establishing this program more thoughtfully, we are working with CPSHR for contract work to help us in this area. We don't have any full-time dedicated staff to diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. It's a team effort right now with my staff and I, uh, predominantly myself and my deputy director, Annie Parker, are spending a, a fair amount of time making sure this is done properly. But we are working closely with Jacques Whitfield, who is a tremendous asset to our organization on a contract basis. He has years of experience in this effort, and uh, we've been meeting with him with regularity to ensure that we're doing appropriate trainings for our staff and incorporating suggestions and things that he has uh, recommended from his years of experience. I'm trying to get this slide too. All right, we'll just keep going. The slide is not wanting to comply. So just so, uh, there we go. Um, in terms of the audit recommendations, we have completed all the recommendations from Paula and her team. They were to establish a charter, which we have done, write standard definitions for diversity, equity, and inclusion, which we have done, increase task force member recruitment, which is an ongoing effort, but we are continuing to do that. We have done that already. 
and uh, the charter was reviewed and edited by task force members. We have established cultural awareness months, which we'll be doing uh, both in an internal basis and then external on our digital media platforms as well. We're currently in the middle of Black History Month for which we have um, been putting out videos on our social media pages and our internal newsletter will feature some uh, articles and features from our internal staff as well um, on ways that they wanted to contribute personally. We're working closely with HR on the equity impact report. That's a joint effort between HR and communications to make sure that we are using that data provided to better our uh, outreach efforts. And then we are working with high-speed rail staff overall on continued presentations and trainings. We uh, did a presentation in December where CEO Kelly and I talked about our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in an internal uh, all-staff virtual presentation. The next slide is just a snapshot of some of the cultural awareness months that we have been celebrating and we will continue to celebrate. We got some really good feedback from the advisory group on other uh, awareness months that we should incorporate, including the LGBT community and the disadvantaged, uh, different disadvantaged communities around the state. So we're gonna continue to bolster that effort. The next slide here is a snapshot on the uh, equity impact report that I referenced. So some of our highlights, uh, we are proud of the work that we're doing here at the Authority. Of course, always room to improve. I think this is an effort that is constantly evolving, but just a snapshot on where we stand right now for diversity, both age and ethnicity amongst our uh, rank and file employees. From 2021 to 2022, we had a 5% increase in the hire of rank and file employees under the age of 40. As you know, we're doing a very concerted effort to engage and empower and inspire our younger demographic with our I Will Ride program. The race and ethnicity in 2022 remained fairly consistent with 2021 numbers with white and Asian rank and file employees being the most prominent in 2022. We did have a slight fluctuation of the male to female ratio, 1% increase in male rank and file employees with an overall 52% male, 48% female split amongst rank and file in 2022. In terms of managers and supervisors, most managers and supervisors uh, in 2021 and 2022 were uh, 50 and over. White managers and supervisors remain the highest, so we have more work to do there to create some balance with a, a little bit below 40% in that area. Managers and supervisors remain evenly split in the male female demographic, consistent year over year. The CEA and executive level staff we did have a 9% increase in the number of hires of executive level staff under the age of 50 in 2022. White staff still represent about 50% of the executive level staff that did drop by about 4% since 2021. And females account for about two thirds of our executive level staff. Uh, just in terms of outreach in 2022, I'm really proud of these numbers. Of course, this is within our own team, so I have to give them a little bit of love here. In 2022, we participated in about 359 uh, outreach events. More than 13,300 members of the public were reached. In 2022, 2023, we're gonna try and outdo that. We have established some outreach goals to reach uh, and prioritize communities of color. So we're working closely with our regional uh, directors and our deputy regional directors and their teams to ensure that we are doing a good job of reaching those areas of the state and also providing bilingual outreach effort. We have a number of certified bilingual staff in our communications team. We're gonna keep putting them to work. And then finally, I just want to close with uh, something that I feel that you will all be proud of as we are proud of. We were just honored with the I Will Ride uh, Student Outreach Program was awarded with the Rosa Parks Diversity Award for the WTS Sacramento chapter. This is something that uh, recognizes diversity and equity and inclusion and transportation. So obviously very key to this focus. And we were nominated by uh, Dr. Karen Philbrick and um, also by Beverly Scott with the PRG. So the fact that our external stakeholders are recognizing our work is very important to us. So I just wanted to highlight that. And that's all I have. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Melissa. Any questions for Melissa? I just have have one, uh, and I'm sorry if I if it didn't. Yeah, are there actually goals for each of these areas that you went through? Do we have defined goals that we're we're moving towards or are trying to achieve? So every year we will compare those uh, metrics for hiring and uh, the makeup of our staff, and we're working with HR 
to uh, do additional outreach efforts in specific areas, uh, low income communities, and also uh, job fairs, which we have not done historically. So we'll see the trend on that. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's a lot of work you've accomplished in one year. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move back to uh, public comment. I understand we do have at least one person who wanted to address us. So, um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Before we begin public comment for the High Speed Rail Finance and Audit Committee meeting, I would like to go over some important information for members of the public who have joined in person and wish to provide comment. You will be called on in the order you received your card. If you are joining us in the meeting via Zoom and wish to provide public comment, please use the raise your hand feature located at the bottom of your screen. If you are dialing in by phone, pressing number two will raise your hand and put you into the queue. Speakers will be called up on by the order their hands are raised. Once you're in the queue and your name is called, please click the prompt on your screen to allow your microphone to be unmuted. If you're joining by phone, we will call on you by the last four digits of your phone number. At that point, you will hear a message that your phone is being unmuted. When it is your turn to speak, Please slowly and clearly say your first and last name, and if applicable, state the organization you represent. Mr. Chair, we'll, we'll begin with the um, attendees from Zoom. At this time, I do not see anybody's hand raised. Okay. Ms. Murphy, or do you concur with that? We have nobody. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You bet. Um, members, moving on to uh, item number three, we have an audit report to be presented by our internal auditing manager, um, Paula Rivera. Good morning, Paula. Good morning. I'm Paula Rivera. I'm the Chief Auditor of the Authority, and I'm here to uh, brief you today on an audit that we performed of the contract amendment process. Uh, the, the purpose of the audit was to evaluate the authority's process for requesting, approving, and executing contract amendments. The objectives were to determine if the authority has documented processes in place for approving and executing contract amendments, if they comply with the process, and if they have an efficient contract amendment process. The scope was a three-year period, 2019, 2020, and 2021. Uh, we found that there were documented processes in place and executed contract amendments generally complied, complied with the procedures. Uh, we acknowledge the improvement efforts of the various offices and branches involved in the process. The contract and procurement branch is currently reviewing their desk procedures and working on an updated version. And the contract assessment branch through the contract management work group has begun to develop a continuous improvement process for developing and revising policies and procedures. Also the risk management and project controls office has revisited their draft BOC procedures to determine the necessary revisions. We tested uh, 15 contract amendments, which was 10% of the total amendments for the three-year period. And we found they generally complied with the documented procedures. However, the processes lack key performance indicators to determine the efficiency of the process. Management has not established consistent key performance indicators or KPIs, nor maintained consistent and measurable data throughout the current processes to assess performance. The current KPIs and available data are insufficient to reasonably assess efficiency. Consequently, we could not determine whether or not the contract amendment process is efficient. Uh, we identified uh, one issue and a couple of observations. Um, the issues were uh, discussed with uh, auditee. Uh, in this case, the one issue was through the uh, risk management office uh, regarding some draft procedures. Um, and they have submitted a corrective action process, and we don't have any questions regarding uh, or questions or concerns regarding the implementation of the recommendation. Do you have any questions for me? So far, yeah. On issue one, uh, yes. Paula, 
Uh, it said the, <clears throat> the draft business oversight committee procedure dated August 12th, 2020. So that's two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. what, what, what happened during that period? Uh, it was, the procedures were drafted, uh, but they were never finalized and right. they were never distributed. Um, there was a, a change in personnel. Um, there was an interim person who was acting as the uh, business oversight committee um, administrator. Uh, and she reviewed the procedures, made some updates, but as the acting um, wasn't in a position to finalize them. Uh, we now have a um, full-time administrator and they're working to finalize the procedures and we expect that'll be done by June. Okay, they have two and a half year lapse. That shouldn't have that shouldn't happen. Yeah, the two and a half year lapse that shouldn't happen. So hopefully we'll correct that. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions, Paula? Were, were, was that surprising? I mean, can you just in the general general realm of severity, how severe is this? Um, I wouldn't say it's severe. We had good people in place who were uh, helping those who needed to understand the process. There was just not a resource available to someone who would like to know, how do I go through this process? I see. Um, we didn't find anything that slipped through the cracks or um, didn't get handled. Um, like I said, we have good people uh, working in the process. There's just not an available resource to be able to for a contract manager to be able to look at a procedure and say, what do I need to do? What are the requirements? What is the timeline? Okay. So I wouldn't say it's severe at all. Okay. And what you were looking at were was auditing uh, policies and procedures, not, not the empirical data of what an amendment might be and whether the amounts were justified or any of that sort of thing, but it's the process that you're, you're focused on. Correct. Okay. Uh, the business oversight committee is the governance process that right. determines whether or not the amendment is right necessary. The price is reasonable. Okay. So we didn't question the governance. All right. Yeah. You all done? Yep. That's it. Yes. My gosh. All right, uh, thank Paula. You. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now move on to the executive summary uh, by our chief financial officer. Good morning, Mr. Annis. Good morning, uh, f and committee. I'm gonna go through our PowerPoint uh, financial reports, executive summary, uh, reporting data through December 31st, 2022. Uh, we start out at the, the top of the next page with our accounts payable aging and disputes report and happy to continue to report. We have not incurred a, a late payment penalty or had a late payment in over five years. We're 71 months now. Um, in terms of disputes, uh, our disputes excluding uh, Dragados Flatiron are under a million dollars. Uh, but as discussed before, we, we do have a number of uh, invoice disputes with Dragados Flatiron where they do submit uh, some work in their invoices that have has not yet been approved. It's still under um, submittal under negotiation. Uh, move down to the bottom of this page, we have our cash management report. Uh, and we reflect as uh, for the ending uh, uh, December, uh, almost 1.8 billion in cash resources. And that's primarily cap and trade cash balance of about 1.7 billion and about 100 million in Prop 1A uh, bond cash balances. Uh, one thing to note is we're uh, on the Prop 1A side, of course, the legislature appropriated another $4.2 billion of Prop 1A in June. We uh, submitted to the board and then to the Department of Finance and the legislature a funding plan that was approved in November. And now we're happy to report that we're seeing some of those new Prop 1A dollars uh, flow into our cash balances. Uh, just last week, the treasurer's office uh, sold a commercial paper that will bring us uh, $200 million of Prop 1A cash. Uh, they expect to sell another $200 million before the end of this month. And then they go out for their spring bond sale next month. 
and we expect to net another about 1.1 billion uh, from the uh, full bond sale that they only do twice a year. So we do expect uh, by the end of March to have about access to about 1.5 billion of that 4.2 billion that the legislature appropriated. Uh, what we plan to do with that, in some cases, uh, we are going to convert uh, prior cap and trade expenditures that have occurred since July to 1A. So going forward, uh, you're gonna, I, I believe, observe uh, cap and trade balances start to increase uh, both as we credit new auctions and proceeds, but also as we refund uh, uh, recent uh, cap and trade uh, payments and uh, instead pay, uh, pay those uh, invoices in the accounting records with the new Prop 1A balances. So again, you'll, you'll see some changes going forward with that. Um, in terms of cap and trade, an auction did occur yesterday. Uh, however, we will not know the results until next Thursday. Uh, so uh, we'll uh, notify the f and members by email when we find out those preliminary results next week. Uh, the, the total here for the cash balance does not yet include the November cap and trade auction, which we estimate will bring in for us about $190 million. But that takes a, a, a period of time with the uh, Department of Finance and the State Controller's Office before we reflect that in our cash balance. Brian, if I may, is the release of the uh, additional uh, Prop 1A funding, the 4.2 billion, is it tied in any way to the appointment? Uh, are we able to, obviously we must be able to access that in advance of the appointment of an uh, IG? That's correct. Yeah, there was a provision in the uh, implementing legislation that uh, requires us to do some additional reporting before we access the final 2.2 billion oh. of that 4.2 billion. And so what we'll do in the future uh, is uh, we do report on, a, uh, on our need for that additional 2.2 billion. And uh, the, uh, uh, the incoming inspector general uh, would uh, review that as well as the legislature. There's no need for any further legislation or anything like that. It's right. fully appropriated, but there is some reporting. So you do have access then to 2 billion of the 4.2. That's okay. correct. Thank you. Right. And the inspector general, uh, by the way, uh, the process for that is underway. Uh, the legislature uh, put out a notice in the fall uh, to accept applications and they let, put in a three month window uh, to accept applications and that closed at the end of January. So now we're waiting for them to uh, nominate three individuals for the governor's consideration. Uh, the next page is our administrative budget. Uh, at the second line down here, you'll note our expenditures in December were $5.6 million for the month uh, compared to about $5.0 million uh, a year ago in December. Uh, the primary reason for that, if you look toward the bottom, is we've filled about uh, 41 vacant positions year over year. So that's uh, most of the explanation for the extra about $600,000 being spent uh, month to month. Moving on to our capital outlay budget, uh, we reflect uh, capital outlay expenditures in the month of December at $73 million. Uh, you note here, uh, comparison in November was 125 million. Uh, we had some uh, one-time expenditures in November that, that brought that total higher. Also note, uh, there was quite a bit of rain in December that uh, did reduce the days in the, in the field. Um, we also, in the middle of the page, uh, show how that uh, breakout occurred in terms of specific payments for the each design bill contractor, uh, CP1 at about 20 million, 2-3 at about short of 24 million and, and CP4 at about 5 million. One thing I wanted to point out at the bottom of the chart here is uh, we do uh, uh, about this time of year uh, uh, update our what we call fiscal year forecast, which is the second column of the bottom table. And we do uh, show this to the board because this is something we do 
in part uh, be, uh, for our Federal Railroad Administration reporting. Uh, they do quarterly ask us to uh, show our, our, our forecast of expenditures. And so once we get through the first half of the year, if we're not trending to spend at the full budget level, we do uh, a new forecast in the fiscal year for uh, what we might instead spend. And then that goes into, again, our FRA reporting when we're showing both our current fiscal year expenditures and our projections for spend expenditures going forward. So that doesn't change our uh, budget authority in any way for the fiscal year, but we just note it for transparency here as well. So the key to that is what you said at the end, I guess. The, the, uh, column one is budget authority. So that's what you can't go go over. We but would the, have to come back to the board yeah, right. if we were going to exceed that. It just has always been interesting to me how much the forecast is less than the budget authority and almost from the beginning. And I don't remember a year that we ever met the budget. Yeah, well, I think typically there's, uh, we're gonna come in below the budget because uh, I think in every area, there's a little bit of a, a contingency, if you will, uh, to manage. But uh, I, I think we need to do better at coming closer. <laughs> I would rather see us at uh, 70 or 80%, uh, not not 50%. And we did bring the number down. Uh, I know the the budget for 22-23 was was less than the projection would have a year prior for 21-22. So we did uh, we did push some of these forecast numbers down and anticipate doing more of that as we uh, put together the 23-24 budget. I think that's a good plan. I mean because we do get criticized for uh, having a budget and never never achieving the metrics of that mm -hmm. budget. That's a good idea. Thanks, Brian. Um, on this page, uh, we uh, start at the top with our total program expenditures, and this goes all the way back uh, to 2006. So we're about 10.3 billion spent on uh, implementing the program. Uh, most of that, uh, over 76%, is on our construction expenditures. Uh, on the bottom, uh, we list our current uh, federal grants. Um, we, uh, as I, I, I believe the board knows, we uh, had applied for a, a grant or two grants through the, the mega program. And we did find out at the end of December that we were not successful in, in being awarded that. Uh, but uh, that, uh, happy to hear certainly the comments of the FRA administrator uh, mm -hmm. two days ago, you know, indicating that, uh, the upcoming Fed State Partnership Program is a good program for us to apply for uh, because that's a right. program specific to inner city rail. But our lack of selection in, in the mega projects uh, portion of this of the IIJA um, wasn't such a really that uh, a reflection on this project or the authority, but rather the entire state of California only got $30 million. That's correct. Uh, Brian, that's a what a five-year program total. Yeah, and, and we there there was a provision in that program that allowed the uh, office of the secretary at, at USDOT to award multiple years of funding in year one, and so uh, we applied with that in mind that we thought it's possible they could award three years of funding, four years of funding. So. Uh, we we had uh, the two applications that were a bit over 1.2 billion, so we actually applied for more than they ended up giving out to all recipients. They basically awarded only year one of the program. So they changed the provision, I guess, midstream. Is that correct? Well, it was an allowance. It wasn't. Uh, they they gave themselves a flexibility to award more, but at the end of the day, they decided to award a smaller set of. I guess relatively lower lower cost. Uh, so projects. we're not we're not out of the ball game. So the, the, we'll we'll have another another one next year, then another one the year after, the year after, blah blah blah, until we get to five years. Yeah, absolutely. And and we do we availed ourselves of an opportunity to confer with the USDOT already to uh, get their thoughts on our past application and advice for what we might do going forward. Yeah, so I just want to make sure that the public knows that. This wasn't a slap in the face for high speed rail. This this was just the way the, the feds are giving money out. And mm -hmm. so we're still in the ball game and, and we'll go forward from there. Thank Absolutely. you. So as part of that money though for mega, 
I think it, an addition, there was some additional, what, 2.1 or $2.2 .2 billion in 22 that has now been added to the first uh, federal state. That's the, uh, yeah, that's the, these are separate pots, the Meg and the federal right. state, the federal state pot, which is a, a grant that's dedicated solely to inner city rail is uh, it will, the first grant opportunity for that will happen in 2023. I'll talk about this a little bit in our broader hearing. Uh, and what the federal government just did is they added a second year to that that grant. So that timeline. was so that was and it took it up to about uh, four point five then. Yeah, on the order of four point five okay. billion. And, and that, that's just but, the but first two years both, of that. Both, those are then both federal state. Is that what you were saying? Yes. Okay. It's all in the federal state pot. Okay. Mega will have a, a secondary round. I expect this year, and another one the year after that, and another one the year after that. The change that Brian referenced, which I think was uh, did affect our our um, outcome in the mega was really the when the federal government first uh, passed the IIJA and these dollars were available for large capital projects. The mega program originally was conceived larger projects only and and over multiple years. And I think as they are starting to let out the dollars, they're being careful, which is not unreasonable. But in taking that approach, they were clear that they wanted to only do one year. And they backed away a little bit from just going with larger projects. And so we saw that. That was the first year of this. Again, Tom, as you mentioned, which is absolutely correct, the entirety of the state of California applied for a lot, uh, and only one project was awarded for $30 million. On a national basis, there was on the order of 128 applicants, and only nine were rewarded uh, anything. So it, it was one, one round of one program in a very large pot, and we have had very productive conversations with the FRA since that, and we're looking forward to the Fed State program this year. So. And for the people in the public, IIJA uh, is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So. Yeah. Right. Uh, contract and expenditure report. Uh, we do uh, report month over month that our total value of contracts increased from about 10.4 billion to 10.8 billion. Uh, that's a combination of things, uh, some executed change orders, uh, some contract amendments to our uh, project construction manager contracts. And lastly, we executed a new contract with Caltrans relative to the State Route 46 project. Uh, the board had approved at the August meeting uh, going forward with that contract. Okay. Um, let me go forward. So on our contingency reporting, um, at the top table in the middle here, we report we have a total project contingency remaining at the end of December uh, for the CP specifically of about $357 million. Uh, we have, uh, of course, seen these balances come down. Um, we anticipate coming to the full board next month uh, to ask for additional expenditure authority to replenish some of these contingencies. And Brian's going to talk more about that in terms of uh, the project update report uh, at the uh, full board meeting today. Okay. Um, at the bottom of the sheet, we do list the uh, contract amendments in this case that exceeded 25 million. Uh, both of the uh, project construction management contracts for CP1 and 2.3 had expiration dates of December 2022. So for each of those, uh, those were extended uh, into 2024. And uh, the amounts uh, are listed there, 66 million and 43 million. I also wanted to mention something that was in last month's report. So the board is make sure you're aware. Uh, we also last uh, month had reported the a Deer Creek uh, change order for CP23, that was a big one. And we utilized both the CP23 contingency for that, but we also used some of the unallocated program-wide contingency, about 76 million uh, to execute that change order. Okay. And lastly, uh, I conclude with the uh, a look ahead of preliminary data for the month of January, which we'll report in full next month. Uh, month over month, uh, construction expenditures were about 
uh, about the same, a little down month over month to about $69 million in January relative to 73 in uh, December. A report bottom left, a little bit of uh, further progress on filling vacancies and another four positions filled. And lastly, on the federal grant side, uh, we do have three uh, currently pending grant applications with the federal government totaling uh, $303 million. Uh, these are uh, primarily around uh, executing uh, construction of grade separations in the town of uh, Shafter, uh, just south of Poplar Avenue. Uh, there's six grade separations that would be built there. So we've uh, applied for those programs and we've additionally used those applications to uh, ask for funding to extend the job training center in Selma, California. Uh, the federal government's uh, voice support of that program. So we've uh, asked them to be a funding partner for an extension of that program. Uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, uh, Mr. Annis. Uh, Director Gilmetti, any other questions? Uh, Director Miller? No, I'm fine, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian. Good morning, Mr. Horgan. This is our, for people following the do documents, this is in our section 11, Central uh, Valley Update Construction. Good morning, Chair Richards and FNA committee members. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, communications team for taking our report and putting it in a more readable fashion for anyone who is looking at the projectors because you will have noticed in the past that some of the um, notes were not exactly legible. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the Central Valley status report for the month of December. So contractors expenditures totaled 48.5 million. This was made up of the CP1 contract, which was 19.7 million. CP23 was 23.5 million and CP4 was 5.3 million. In terms of change orders, in the month of December, we executed 18 change orders. That came out with a negative figure. The reason for the negative figure is that for the Hanford Viaduct, whilst we were negotiating the lump sum for the Hanford Viaduct superstructure, we did issue a time and materials change order. Once we negotiated the lump sum change order, we rescinded the time and materials change order, hence the negative figure. Okay, in terms of risk contingency, as of the end of December, we had a risk contingency balance of 357 million. Okay, I'm just gonna move on to the next slide. Yes. Mr. Horgan, so on the time and materials change order, that that accounts for then the delay, which includes inflation and that sort of thing. So is there any other, what else is involved in, in incorporated in the time and materials change order? So the time and materials was basically to allow the contractor to continue with the work whilst we were negotiating the lump sum. I see. You may recall, Tom, that we executed time and materials to allow work in, to continue while we were negotiating the broader change order cost. Then when we settled the negotiation on the broader change order, we credited back the time and materials. Okay, time. thank Contract. you. Okay. Okay, in terms of um, structures, guideway, over bridges, viaducts, 100% completed. Um, however, not all design is completed. We're still working our way through the utility designs. And I can give a quick update on where we are with utility designs. Overall, we're 86% completed with utility designs. And for CP1, we're at 87%. CP23, we're at 82% complete. And at CP4, we're at 93% complete. Okay, in terms of construction labor, we had uh, 964 workers on site in December. Um, and then if we look at the construction progress, we had 69 structures in construction or complete out of a total of 93. And in terms of guideway of 88 miles of guideway in construction or complete out of a total of 119. And I'll talk a little bit more about the progress uh, later. Can, can you also just comment on, with regards to structures and guideways, I, I think maybe for the last three meetings, there have we've we've had no movement at least in terms of numbers. Yes, I, I will talk about that in the next slides, Tom. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Next slide. 
uh, utility relocations. In the month of December, we relocated 23 utilities. This brings our total utility relocations now to 53%. In addition to the 53% that are relocated, we have another 19% in progress, and we have another 2% approved to start. However, we do have 25% that are not approved to start. And as, as I've said in several meetings, what I mean by not started is a sequence of activities must be, must be um, commenced to ensure that we get a start. So that activities include environmental clearance, executed third parties, obviously design approval, uh, construction walkthroughs, uh, acquisition of real property and our land conveyances. But we are making very good progress with utilities and with Dennis Kim now also appointed as the executive in charge of right away and third parties. This has given uh, more focus to utilities and we are making significant progress. Is any of this uh, holding up work for, with the contractors? Um, no, at the moment, no. We are making good progress with the um, utility companies. There are some agreements that are more <laughs> problematic, but utilities are moving at a reasonable pace at the moment, Jim. So we don't, we don't think we're gonna have a problem in this com coming year? Not with <laughs> utility relocations. There are some agreements and we will talk a little bit more about third party agreements when we come to see people. Yeah, I'm, I'm more worried about holding up the contractors in, in construction. No, for a, and, and you can see from the figures, the projections for CP23, uh, the contractor is, is up to practically full production. CP1, we do have a couple of significant um, interfaces with the railroads and we're working our way through those. Thank you. Hey, Jim, just a, <clears throat> I think a variation on that, but that's important to understand is <clears throat> while it's true, we have 74% of the structures are underway or complete. And so we're working through a lot of those things. There's obviously a, a schedule involved with each of those, but uh, I also think it's fair to say when you talk about, as Tom asked a minute ago, sort of the flatness of the number of structures that are started, that does have to do with some of the, the slowness of working through the third party agreements. So the reason we're putting greater management focus on getting third party agreements approved and settled is because we we want to see the structure count go up. And so we are trying to advance things in that regard. And that's why we're putting a higher focus on of getting these approvals done earlier so we can see that move north. Okay, in terms of real property, uh, again, very successful month. We delivered 41 parcels of land to the design build contractor. So. And the recent past, that's probably a record. So that was a tremendous work again by Dennis Kim and his right away team. There is one note on that that I also just want to make you recall in the right away stuff, we set out a series of goals for 2022. In June, we were to hit 90%, we hit 91. And at the end of the year for this month, our goal was 95% and we're at 96. So the right away team under Dennis Kim's leadership has done a tremendous, tremendous job. <laughs> Okay, next slide. In terms of uh, project development, uh, main update here is that the Palmdale to Burbank comment period has closed for the draft EIR and EIS, and at present we are reviewing the comments and addressing those. In terms of project development, obviously you're aware that we have consultants on board for the Merced and Bakersfield extension, and they've commenced work on the 30% design. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is the basically the histogram of contractors' expenditures. Month of December was 48 million. Okay, next slide. This slide shows the projected drawdown of contingency. We are showing a contingency balance, a projected contingency balance in. Mr. Horgan, I'm sorry. Million. I just want to just clarify also for the month of December, I assume the reduction. Uh, is into two parts, one because of the season, Christmas, and the other, a good deal of rain. Yes, and we also have during the December month, the uh, the freight railways moratorium. Right. Thanks. Okay, so as I said, the drawdown of contingency, we're projecting a remaining balance of contingency of 190 million in March. Slide. Okay, the, uh, <laughs> it's not moving anymore. 
Okay, there we go. This is the construction labor. Uh, so I'd just like to point out that even though December had 964 construction workers, if we compare that with December of 22, it was 766. So this is an increase of 200. Uh, obviously with the heavy rains and everything in January, uh, January is not gonna be a great month in terms of construction labor. All right, so we're gonna come to construction progress. Okay, so as you said correctly, uh, Chair Richards, the, we haven't been able to open many new structures or guideway in the uh, recent past. We are projecting that we're gonna open up um, four new structures in the uh, June period. There will be uh, one new structure opening up on CP1 and three new structures opening up on CP23. But if we look at what we have achieved of the structures that are in progress or complete, we've got 36 structures fully completed. So that's 36 completed. And we also have 49 miles of guideway completed. So in the month of December, there was also three new structures completed. There was Fowler Avenue and Adams Avenue. Uh, both of those are over bridges and they were open to traffic. We also completed the Cairo Viaduct and the roadway underneath the Cairo Viaduct is now in operation as well. So that was, and in terms of CP4, which is obviously nearing completion, we had in just recently on the 10th of February, we completed the final concrete deck pour. So that was the last significant concrete pour on CP4. So that was a milestone. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, this slide shows the progress with uh, utility relocations. In the month of December, we had 23 more utilities relocated. So this brings our total of utilities either relocated or in progress to 1,333. That is 72% of the total. Next slide. Um, Next slide. Do we have any, any more surprises on utility relocations coming up? That's a very good question, Jim. Um, Brian Kelly is going to talk a little bit more about this in his report as well. Brian is working closely with the uh, the governor's office to advocate with some of the uh, third parties. And we are working at executive level with all the railroads and with the significant third parties. That's a good handoff. I mean, I don't, it's not a surprise, though. I mean, the, the reality is we're grinding through the third party agreements. This is the price we've been paying for some time on doing work out of sequence before. And, and we're putting all of our management attention now through uh, promotions and focus on getting these important pre-construction agreements done so we can move the utilities and get into full construction. And we're gonna we are, have already and are uh, elevating the process for higher level conversations where we need to, to get those agreements completed. And we're gonna continue that. So the idea is to put a really keen focus on Primarily pg and &E and UP, I would say, are the, the primary challenges that we have left. We have other partners we're working through, but we are advancing that work um, in a reasonable way. And we just got a lot left to do with those two. And so um, we're looking to elevate that work and, and get it done. <clears throat> okay, uh, next slide is the right away. As, as I said earlier, we have 41 right away packages delivered to the design bill contractors, which is really good. Dennis Kim did ask me to point out that in the coming months, the figures would be lower as we're coming to the end of the right-of-way delivery. So for the next three or four months, it's gonna be more like five or six per month. So I have, again, a similar question. Are, are, have we identified all the right-of-way that we need? There's no more surprises coming? I Substantially, yes. There, until we've got all the utility designs fully completed, Jim, there is a risk that we may have to add or subtract a few parcels, but it is in the, it is more like a handful. Okay, so he had a, that was a record-breaking month, 40, 41 deliveries. Yeah. Does he get a bonus for that yeah. at the end of the year? I, I think you'll, you'll have to ask uh, Mr. Kelly that question. Gets uh, <laughs> eternal gratitude from the CEO. It's, uh... <laughs> Please congratulate Dennis for us. Yeah. I agree with that. I want to commend the staff and Dennis. Is he at the meeting? No. 
Oh, all right. I was just going to say I would take him for coffee. All right. Thank you. <laughs> No, Jim, just I do want to answer something you said, Jim, because it does get to like where we've been and where we are now, which I think is important. When 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 I started here in 2018, uh, we had about 1400 parcels delivered to the um, uh, design build contractors. And at that time, the estimate was we needed 1750. Uh, well, the reality is we needed 2300. And of that, we're over 2200 delivered now. So we really are coming down to the end. Uh, I expect by the end of 23 of the uh, through February, we got about 86 parcels left to do At the end of 23 that'll be cut in half and we'll finish the remnant remaining ones at the end of that. I say that too, because the 2300 figure as as uh, Daniel mentioned around some of the design issues for moving utilities that 2300 has been on a given month 2998 2305. But that's the bounce now. The bounce is a few one direction or the other and not hundreds. So again, the project definition is a universe different today than it was when we started. And we really are coming down to the end of this uh, definition of the 119. So I think that's important. I, I know we've learned our lessons. I know when we start doing these extensions to Bakersfield and, and uh, Merced, um, well, hopefully the, the, the pre-design design is going to identify exactly what right away we need so we can get a jump on it so on that point uh, i'm going to jump on that opportunity uh, we are have taken a different approach for the extensions to merced and bakersfield uh, we are in 30 percent design now and as part of that process as they get to the full 30 percent, what we call configuration footprint uh, they'll be able to identify a full right away acquisition plan and we can begin starting the acquisition uh, at the end of this year so it is a it's a different approach. We're applying those lessons learned, and I expect much less delay of risk and cost later because of it. <clears throat> okay. Oh, sorry, made a choice. Okay, so this this chart shows the delivery of the uh, railroad parcels of land for the design build contractor. Uh, we're ahead of schedule here. Uh, we're working collaboratively with the railroads. We we are not anticipating any delays here. Next slide. This slide shows the uh, land conveyance uh, packaging. So we have 227 land conveyances left. Of these, 161 are at 85% complete, just waiting for land acquisition. So land conveyancing is another success story. It was very difficult for us probably two years ago. Uh, we have resourced it properly and got a new procedure and it's working um, very, very well. Okay, CP4 earned value. You will probably have heard me say in numerous FNA committee meetings that as long as the solid blue line is above the dotted yellow line, everything is good. Well, it's just about to intersect with the dotted yellow line. So on CP4, there are a couple of um, things that have materialized. One, we obviously had an exceptionally wet uh, January. And the other is there were two agreements, utility agreements, that have taken longer to execute than we anticipated. And this has delayed some of the canal relocation works and some of the embankment. And I know Brian is going to talk a little bit more about this as well in the um, board meeting. I will discuss it further in the board meeting, but uh, to, just in a nutshell on CP4s, we're working through the finalization really, we hope by the end of this month, <clears throat> on a couple of necessary uh, utility agreements with um, irrigation districts down there where we are affecting uh, their property and some of their equipment. Um, we got we to gotta get those done. It's been months in process, and I think it'll... Uh, finish in February, and uh, and then that'll enable us to move uh, forward on the work. I do think that the um, the schedule is being impacted by it, though, and I do think we're going to see a move uh, in the substantial completion date to the end of quarter two rather than the beginning of quarter two. And so we're dealing with that. And as Daniel said, some of the heavy rain in January and December uh, also pushed back some of the work. So that's things we're dealing with. But again, it's a matter of weeks and not you know years here. So uh, again, I think end of uh, June, early July, we should we will reach substantial completion. Thank you, Brian. 
Okay, and this shows the cost trend. This shows the actual cost being behind the forecast. And this is primarily due to the not being able to do the uh, canal relocations and some of the embankment work. Okay, and the final slide is the flash report for January. So for January, we've got, you can see the construction labor numbers are down. It's, it's 874, but if we compare that to 2022, it's still higher. And I can confirm that as of last week, we were back up to 1,211 construction workers. In terms of parcels delivered, uh, Dennis delivered five parcels to the design builders in the month of January. In terms of change orders, we executed a total of 13 change orders, the most significant one being the downtown bridges for CP1, and that was for uh, 74.2 million. Which, which one was that again? Uh, that was on CP1 downtown bridges. It's, okay. it's for the, basically the bridges yeah. at Fresno, Tulare, yeah. and Ventura. Okay. And let's see. And in terms of utility relocations, we completed one utility relocation in the month of January, which was what we had planned to do. Okay, that concludes the report. Thank you. Yeah, on the, the downtown Fresno, Tulare, Ventura Street bridges, that. That's a change order based on the city of Fresno wanting it, right? So Brian is going to notify you at the in the CEO report, but it's got just two impacts. One was from the railroad and the other was from the city of Fresno. Okay. I could comment on this too, Jim. <laughs> That's, um, much of the, as, as you might recall last year, uh, early in the year, and we, uh, echoed this in the 2022 business plan is that on CP1, we identified several large change orders that we needed to get through negotiations on. And those were largely tied to third party scope changes that were agreed to between 2015 and 2018. Those scope changes needed final design, they needed final scope, final cost, and then that needed to be executed into the contract. We spent much of 22 and even into the last month and coming into this month, getting those done. Uh, we're now at the end of those major ones, um, but it is again uh, agreements for perhaps it's City of Fresno or UP or other entities where there were scope changes that uh, were agreed to. We had to get that work done and put those in the contract. And that's that's really what, what the work is and what we've, we're coming to the end of on the, the big change orders on CP1. So the, the, the key is uh, there's scope changes from scope that we didn't have at the offset. So these are scope, actually additions that were probably there from the beginning, but not defined. Yeah, I mean, they, unfortunately, they were scope changes post-contract award. So we had a contract award, and then you had negotiations with third parties that sought changes to the uh, to the scope of the work. And and again, you know, it's one thing to commit to those, but then you got to execute and, and put that scope, get that design done, recost that put that scope in the contract and move forward in the, in the contractual way. And that's what we are working to complete for CP1 now. If there are no other questions in Dan Daniel, thank you very much. Thank you. Tom. Okay. And ladies and gentlemen, that uh, does complete the agenda for today's uh, finance and audit committee meeting. Uh, we encourage you to join us at 11 o'clock for the board meeting. Um, same time, or not same time, but certainly the same place. Anyway, thank you very much, and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bye-bye.